Welcome. Can you hear me back there? Any problems with uh, hearing? Good. My name is Jim Stokely, and I'm with the Wilma Diamond Legacy. Those of you who've been to previous sessions will have kind of heard the next minute. It's a spiel. I'm going to go through this spiel. I would like to say a few words about the legacy. We're a tax-exempt public charity located uh, in Weaverville, founded in 2012 to sustain and promote Wilma Dykeman's core values. There are three core values, environmental integrity, social justice, and the power of the written and spoken word. And the legacy sponsors lectures, programs, events such as this in the Asheville area. We are a virtual organization. We're not bricks and mortar. Mother didn't really believe in bricks and mortar. She saw it, she felt it, but uh, she believed in more abstract uh, things than uh, concrete and, uh, and brick. We partner with organizations like Riverlink, the Osher Lifelong Learning Center at UNCA, and Buncombe County Public Libraries. We have no paid employees. All of our members uh, help us with uh, with contributions, and those contributions go to speaker honoraria, travel expenses. It does cost something to bring Hannah home, for example, from Grand Mesa, Colorado, if you can believe that. Um, we also print materials such as what you have uh, in your chairs when you sat down. Please consider becoming a friend of Wilma Dykeman. Uh, it's through member contributions that we can continue producing programs such as this one. And even though we were in competition with not only everything in the world that's happening in Asheville this weekend, including Moog Fest, we're in competition with Mother Nature herself. I mean, well, this is the best day in the world. So it's a light turnout. However, we are videotaping this for the ages uh, with the help of Jim Rosario back there from AB Tech. Before you leave, please do two things. Please fill out the speaker evaluation form, and if you have not already done so, uh, put you, on your way out, put your email address on one of the sign-up pads for a free monthly word from Wilma. Now I'd like to say a few words about Leah Matthews, who is going to introduce our main speaker. And following uh, Hannah Holmes' presentation, Leah is going to share her thoughts about how Colorado's water history and challenges might relate to Western North Carolina. She'll also lead a question and answer slash discussion session. Dr. Matthews is the interdisciplinary distinguished professor of the Mountain South at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. She received her BA in economics, French, and international affairs from Marquette University and her PhD <coughs> in applied economics from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Matthews' research focuses on the valuation, listen to this, the valuation of those things that you can't buy on supermarket shelves, like water quality, scenic quality, and culture, cultural heritage. I mean, it's just wonderful that she's here in this area because that's what we've got, and it is valuable. We don't know how valuable. Her most recent research attempts to better understand why people value these intangibles and how the social, cultural, and natural forces that influence these values are related with a focus on local food and farmland. Current projects include an examination of how the relationships between buyers and sellers affect purchases at farmers markets and a study measuring the effectiveness of alternative local food messages. So please welcome Dr. <coughs> Leah Graydon Matthews. Thank you, Jim, and thanks all of you for, for coming today. I, uh, before I introduce Hannah, I want to say that I was really honored when Jim invited me to be part of this uh, the series, in part because uh, The French Broad was one of the very first books I read when I moved to this area 17 years ago to get to know a little bit more about the area. So uh, I feel a, a great honor to be part of this, this series. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce Hannah Holm, who is the coordinator and co-founder of the Water Center at Colorado Mesa University. In the late 1980s, she was a research assistant for the North Carolina General Assembly, where she helped staff committees on the environment, natural resources, sustainable agriculture, and smart growth. She has a joint master's degree in community and regional planning and Latin American studies from the University of Texas at Austin, and a bachelor's degree in anthropology from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome, Hannah. Thank 
you so much. Um, can everybody hear me? Is this one not on? Okay. You know, I'm going to use this one so I don't have to. Oops. Okay. How about how about this one? I think I think it is now. It, it'll take a minute, but I think it's it's coming. This one. This one says it's on. Can you hear now? Well, it's not very loud. Okay. No, not that loud. It doesn't sound like it's on. I think this one sounded. Hello? Hello? That, that one's on. Okay, I'll turn this one. Hello? I'll just speak up and use this one. Okay. Okay, how's that? Is that all right? <coughs> okay, well, um, I just wanted to correct one thing. Um, that I, I actually was in Raleigh working for the North Carolina legislature in the late 1990s, not the, not the late 1980s, oh, so that's okay. So just, uh, just for context on what my background was, um, it seemed like the period that I was here was when every major hurricane that was making landfall um, in the continental United States was hitting Wilmington and, and a lot of the water issues that were going on out here, which was how I really got oriented to um, environmental law um, and the Clean Water Act and all that, it was involved, um, you know, Hurricane Floyd coming in and hog waste all over the place and there were some other uh, issues related to buffer rules along the Noose River and um, so it was a really interesting time to be out here in North Carolina and I'm just so pleased to be able to, to be back here. I'm really honored to be part of this uh, important speaker series and it is just springtime in Asheville, and it sounds like especially today, um, it's just a wonderful place to be. I spent most of my morning actually down along the French Broad River enjoying your, um, your very beautiful greenway down there, and it seemed like half the town was out there with me, and it was just wonderful to see. So um, that kind of, um, I, I just am always happy to see the community really appreciating the water resources in their area. And um, it was also interesting to learn that William D Wilma Dykeman's legacy involved both um, environmental protection and social justice issues because that really, those two issues are very entwined in what I'm going to talk, be talking about today, which is um, challenges related to allocating water resources um, where I come from in western, western Colorado. So um, I do hope that my description of the water challenges and how we're addressing them in my part of the world um, does help you think maybe in a few different ways, maybe um, provide some insi insights onto you know, how you can look at your own water challenges and deal with them, but and I'm really glad that Leah's here to provide those bridging remarks because, um, because I don't really have the expertise in the local water issues to be able to do that for you. Uh, just a little bit of basic background on the Water Center at CMU. Um, Colorado Mesa University is a, it's a regional state university and our mission at the Water Center is to promote research, education, and dialogue on the water issues that are facing the upper Colorado River Basin. So that's basically the entire geographic area that drains into Lake Powell. Um, so at the core of it is really trying to promote understanding uh, among the public, among decision makers, among everyone involved, of what is at stake when we do and don't make water decisions. So, to get going, um, just to let you know kind of where, where I'm going with this presentation, um, the print's a little fine up there, but um, I'll start off with a description of where I'm coming from. The context is quite a bit different than here. <laughs> We're a water-rich valley, but in a very dry region, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we face in Colorado going forward. Um, we have a forecasted gap between supplies and demands. And then I'll kind of jump out, I'll zoom out a little bit to the Colorado River Basin as a whole, which not only has a projected gap, but it has a very immediate gap in the present. In the present. And then I'll, um, after I, you know, say a lot of scary things about, <laughs> about where we're at, then um, I'll end on, on some, of the, some of the initiatives and agreements that I do think hold out some hope for our ability to solve some of the problems that can really seem intractable at times. So. And uh, because the context environmentally, politically, and 
legally is so different between Western Colorado and Western North Carolina. Um, please, if at any point I say something that's confusing or um, you'd like some clarification on, just stop me and, and I can explain it. Uh, but our plan was to try to hold the more kind of conceptual and analytical and big picture kind of questions for the discussion at the end. So is that all right with everybody? Okay. So where is Grand Junction, Colorado? I call it almost Utah, Colorado. We're on the far western edge, um, the far western edge of the state. And we always know exactly how far from Utah we are because there's a quirk of our road numbering system. We have like 23 road, 26 road, 30 road. And if you're on 30 road, you're 30 miles from the Utah border. So <laughs> I'm about at 26 road or so. So about two hours from Moab down here. And we actually, there are about 100,000 people in our little valley. And that is the largest metropolitan area between Denver, four hours to the east, and Salt Lake City, about four and a half hours to the west, the northwest. So um, we're not a very big town, but we're the biggest thing around for, for a long ways. So um, that's just a And you can see from these pictures here um, that, you know, that we're talking a dry place. You know, this is a desert here. It, did, um, it is at the junction of two of the biggest rivers in the dry southwest, however. Uh, the Colorado River and the Gunnison River come together in Grand Junction, and the Colorado River used to be called the Grand River, which is why we're Grand Junction. But it's really, it was born as a farming community, and orchards are still, they're not as big a part of the economy as they used to be, but they're a huge part of our identity, and our peaches are so good. They're very, very, um, very, very good. But it's, so it has an agricultural history, that's the reason this place exists. Um, but it is also increasingly becoming a mountain biking destination. That's a little um, pump track that's at one of the mountain biking trailheads about 10 minutes from town. That's my daughter. <laughs> and then um, this is the Colorado National Monument, which is uh, sort of like a scaled down version of some of the Canyonlands country that you typically associate with Utah. And then this is the Colorado River near the Colorado-Utah line. So we have a history with resource extraction and um, agriculture, but those kind of amenities, um, those kind of intangible amenities on uh, the recreation and tourism com uh, economy is becoming more and more important to our area. And it's, it's changing the way that we relate to our, to our water resources. So just, um, I always like to, fairly early on, start talking about where we get our water. And it wasn't until I really started to be employed, educating other people about water, that I routinely started to think about where the water comes from that supports the communities I live in. Um, so our water in Grand Junction, um, we're actually really fortunate with our water resources. Our drinking water mostly comes from a, a 10,000 foot flat top mountain, that's the Grand Mesa up here, uh, so we get the fresh snow melt, we're the first users, we don't have to, you know, it hasn't gone through any toilets before it gets to us. So we've got good supplies of, of fresh snow melt that piles up on that mountain. This is, uh, they're just opposite sides of the, same, of the same mesa. This is the city of Grand Junction's watershed and this is the uh, Ute Water watershed and they're the biggest water provider in the county. They serve all the small towns and unincorporated areas. So that's where we get our drinking water from, but our irrigation water, um, which is much higher in volume than the drinking water, um, that comes pretty much straight out of the Colorado and the Gunnison rivers, which come down. That um, proved very inconvenient for drinking, especially with like early 20th century technologies. There's a saying about the Colorado that it's too thin to plow and too thick to drink. So um, it tends to be really muddy. <laughs> and this, is, this here is one of our oldest irrigation diversions uh, the Grand Valley Irrigation Company, this is their, their dam. So you see, we're not talking Hoover Dam. You don't have to raise the level real far to get it out into the ditches. And then this is a fish ladder, a fish passageway. But this was established, um, this, the founding, the appropriation date for this, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. But um, basically when they started diverting water out of this canal, that was the same date, that was in like 1882, I think, um, when the city of Grand Junction was founded. 
So our community was born hand in hand with the development of water out of these two rivers. Um, our community wouldn't be able to exist without it. And you can see, I like this picture here. It's, uh, you know, this is up in, up on that 10,000 foot mountain. Our elevation in town's about 4,500 feet. So, um, and this green part here is the irrigated part of the valley. And then ex directly up, you know, up gradient from where the irrigation canals are, you can see what cover the color the land is. It's brown, it's desert. We get about eight inches of rain in a year. So, um, so if you're gonna grow anything, you're not gonna be doing it with rain unless you're growing prickly pear and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, so any kind of aerial view really you know, shows you how closely tied our community is to not just the rivers, but be, our capacity to get the water out of the rivers and put it on the land, which you know, has all sorts of negative consequences sometimes too, but our community wouldn't be there without that. So as I mentioned, one of the, one of the things that's really different about, um, about Colorado water law, so the legal constraints on who gets to use water and for what, um, compared to uh, pretty much all the eastern states, is that we, like most of the, like pretty much all of the west, I think, are a prior appropriation state. So what that means is your ability to use water um, is conditioned on when you got there. So if you're the first to start taking water out of a stream and using it on your field, you have the most, you have the priority right to that water. And the basic premise is fairness. If you come into a place and you take water out of the stream and your livelihood depends on being able to get that water out of the stream, which it does where we live, I mean, you're not gonna grow anything if you're not irrigating. And then somebody comes in later upstream from you and diverts the whole stream and you don't get any anymore, then you know, there's, a, there's a problem. Um, so our legal system was set up to protect those senior rights. And um, the other thing, uh, and so it has your ability to take water out of a stream and use it, put it to beneficial use, has nothing to do with where your land is. It has nothing to do with whether you live along a stream or not. Um, you could live along the river and you know, somebody could live 10 miles away and they could have a prior call on your river, on the water to yours. And furthermore, you have to let them build a ditch across your property. So um, <laughs> there, I saw a really interesting talk recently that, um, that talked about the founding of this system and how it was really very egalitarian intent. Um, they wanted to um, really spread the water out to the people that could really use it and avoid having it um, kind of locked up in the hands of speculators who bought up all the land right along the rivers. So um, you can only get a legal claim to the right to the water if you actually go out and get it and put it on the land or you show that you have a plausible plan to do that. And um, so because, because of that first in time, first in right system, you know, when you got there and started using the water, and you know where you line up, and we have a whole system of water courts and water cops and everything to, to enforce this. It's a gigantic bureaucracy, um, but it lets everybody know where they stand, pretty much. Um, so, because of this system, where the senior calls are on the river has a lot to do with the flows in the river at any one time. So, this is a picture of the Colorado River Basin in Colorado. This is the headwaters up in near Rocky Mountain National Park. And then um, you know the streams come in, and this is Glenwood Springs, and a really dramatic canyon called Glenwood Canyon. And then downstream we get to Grand Junction, and then you're out at the Utah line over here. The Gunnison is the is the basin just below. And two of the major calling rights on the Colorado River in Colorado are a hydro plant that's about 100 years old um, called the Shoshone Hydro Plant, and then the Cameo Call, which is all the irrigation ditches that come off the Colorado River um, to serve the Grand Valley where I live. And you get some kind of interesting paradoxes, like um, this hydro plant right here basically entirely dries up a three mile stretch of river. It dams it up, takes it through a tunnel, and then runs it through giant penstocks and dumps it back in the river. So it's a catastrophe for that three miles of river, but everybody who is concerned about the 
environment in the river as a whole sees that call as essential to the environmental health of the whole system because it pulls a lot of water, this is a substantial portion of the water that naturally is in the rivers, and, and then it doesn't use it up. So it, the water has to get there to meet that senior right. You know, other people upstream can't take, can't take so much that that, that call isn't met. Um, and then it, it just runs it through the penstocks and it dumps down in the river. So because of that senior call, it limits how much water can get siphoned up up here and run across the divide to serve Denver and other cities. So even though in this little spot right here, it might not be so great for the environment, it's essential to keeping um, substantial flows in the river above it and then also downstream. And this um, cameo call also, which serves our irrigation rights in our valley, um, plays a similar role. It causes a lot of problems, which I'll also discuss, for the stretch of river between where they take the water out and where the return flows come back in, the water that, that goes through the, um, that drains off the fields that isn't taken up by the plants. But it is, again, it's an essential um, kind of legal construct that keeps water flowing down the river to that point. So that's just one of the, it's, it's hard to, it's very situational what's good and bad for the environment in, in the West. I guess, I think everywhere it is, but it's particularly, the case um, where we are. So that's a little bit of the, of the Colorado context. And um, one of our major legal constraints on, on who, gets to, who gets to have access to water. And um, then our other major constraint is the 1922 compact between all the states that share the Colorado River. So this, is, uh, this outlines the upper Colorado River Basin, the hydrologic basin, so all the water that would naturally flow down to this point. And then this is, this is the lower basin. And in, um, around 1922 and leading up to that, um, you know, we had this prior appropriation system developing throughout the West, but um, California in particular was growing a lot faster than our states up here. And so people up here started to really worry that if prior appropriation was um, determined to got access to water across state lines, then we'd never have a chance to grow because all the water would be spoken for downstream before we even got off the ground. So, and around the same time, California wanted to build the Hoover Dam. And so they cut some deals in Congress to, um, you know, to get the money, anyway, it was a, you know, they, they wanted the upper basin support for the construction of Hoover Dam, and in exchange, what the upper basin got was, um, was this agreement that there would be a certain amount of water reserved for use in the upper basin. So they split the river instead of just, you know, waiting to see who, who developed first and, and got claims on it first. So one thing that's important, a couple things that are important to point out about this map is that the lion's share of the water in the river, um, even, you know, that's down here, and definitely that's in Lake Mead, the lion's share of that water comes from elevations above 9,000 feet in Colorado, in Colorado especially, but to some degree in Wyoming and Utah and a tiny bit in New Mexico as well. So the lion's share of the water originates here, the lion's share of both the population and the irrigated agriculture are down here. And of course the use isn't only physically within the basin, it's a lot of the use is outside of the basin. So, um, so the, uh, you know, down in Southern California, that's pretty much where all our winter vegetables come from. And then you also have metro, the metro area, you know, north and south of Denver is a major consumer. Salt Lake City gets some of the water from Utah's part of the basin. Um, Albuquerque and Santa Fe get some of the Colorado River water. So this river, I just want to go back a second to one of my pictures. So that, this river right here, this is near the Colorado-Utah line. Does this look like a river that can support 40 million people? I mean, compare it to the news. This is a tiny river. I grew up in Washington State, and the river that, you know, nobody even, it didn't even rank in the state's rivers that flowed by my house is bigger than that in a lot of places. You know, you can walk across this many times of the year. And this is downstream from our irrigation diversions. 
So there are a lot of people relying, not just even in the basin, but outside the basin, relying on this puny little river. <laughs> so that's why, um, why you have these, um, all these complex legal constraints, because you know, one user really can dry up a whole stream. You know, one user can dry up the whole Colorado River for a big stretch. So all of these uh, legalities around water and who gets access to it you know, become very, very important. <coughs> So um, just to, but this is essentially the problem for the whole region, is that our population's increasing, but there, there's obviously no new water. These graphics are particular to the state of Colorado, um, and it's not just the Colorado Basin, it's the, it's the whole state. Um, but this kind of shows our population is projected to double by 2050, and um, this just gives you an idea of the different demands on, on water and how we use it. About 85% plus or minus goes to irrigated agriculture, about 9% for cities. And then increasingly, environmental and recreational uses of the water have become recognized and valued by people. But they're really late to the game in terms of the legalities. So again, with the prior appropriation system, when you start using the water and when you get that claim recognized in court, determines your priority in the system. So sometime in the 70s, the legislature actually did recognize that, that supporting a healthy environment was a beneficial use of water, and you could get a water right for that, but um, almost all of those environmental water rights are junior to pretty much everybody else on the stream. So there are a lot of years when those are not gonna get met. Um, and then recreation, we have kind of a strange quirk in our law to get a recreational water right you basically have to put a rock in the river <laughs> to make it more fun for boaters. It's called a recreational in-channel diversion. So you have to do something to the river to make it more fun to boat on, and then you can get a water right attached to that um, beneficial use. Somehow we haven't figured out legally how to just protect flows that are fun all on their own without you adding anything to them. Um, but this, this split in how we use water between agriculture and um, and urban uses is, is contentious because agriculture, just as, just as geographically are um, where the water is and um, where the people are is, is, you know, it's not the same. The majority of our use is in agriculture, but a pretty small portion of our population actually works in agriculture and a relatively small part of our economy is in agriculture. I mean, it, it's an important contributor, but compared to other uses, it's small. So the folks in agriculture mostly have a lot of the senior rights, but they're really feeling anxiety about growing cities putting increasing demands on their water. Everybody with me so far? Making sense? All right. So, um, just as in the upper basin where most of the people are and most of the, where most of the water is, there's a disconnect. So this is a map of Colorado and this are natural flows. So more or less about 80% of the natural, naturally occurring water in the state occurs on the west side of the Continental Divide. And over 80% of our population and also most of our high value irrigated agriculture is on the east side. So um, this is partly related to the fact that um, when, you know, in the 1800s when a lot of homesteading was happening, um, there was this idea that, that rain would follow the plow. You know, you go out and settle these places and you plow up the ground and then somehow it'll rain more. And you know, it doesn't matter if it's dry when you get there, it'll, it'll all get wetter. And kind of unfortunately, the hydrology sort of played into that for a while. So a lot of people got settled out on these eastern plains and started, started farming and then you know, that wet period stopped. And so they're like, oh, well we don't have enough water, but look, up here, up here in these mountains, you know, if we can just dig some ditches, then we can bring water to where we need it. And so this, uh, this started over 100 years ago because um, the eastern plains were actually settled long before the western. Uh, the western part of the state. The Utes had claim to this area. They, the army kicked them out in the 18, um, 1870s, 1880s. That's what allowed our area to get homesteaded. Um, 
but there were already people farming out here for a long time and they you know they started digging tunnels and ditches and so this has been going on for over 100 years but the biggest ones uh, started to go in in the 1930s and um, and this is a substantial amount of water that goes from one side of the divide to the other. In the upper Colorado Basin, like around about here, there are, there's well more than half of the natural flows have gone across the divide. So um, you can imagine the impacts on, on streams and so on from, from that. But um, again, there are, just as with the Colorado Basin as a whole, this lightly populated area um, actually managed to cut itself a relatively good deal in the allocation of the Colorado River as a whole, at least better than you would expect for its relative economic and population clout. The folks on the west side of the divide got really organized when some of these big plans um, involving the Bureau of Reclamation were put together to pipe really huge amounts of water over to the east side. And uh, through some very savvy political maneuvering, they got kind of a, it ended up not being quite a one for one deal, but for however much water was developed and sent over the hill, then they would get a reservoir of their own that they could use to even out their, their dry and wet spells. So, um, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that all of these diversions have really devastating impacts on those headwaters areas immediately adjacent. I mean, you dry up a stream, it's, you know, that, that's, that has an impact. But um, for folks downstream, like the farmers in the Grand Valley, I mean, they didn't like that all that water was going over the hill, um, especially because that's the best water, you know, the highest mountain snow melt, that's the cleanest water. It's gonna dilute all the other pollutants that come into it further downstream. But they got some big reservoirs, and because of the big reservoirs, they got in exchange for those trans mountain diversions, Really, like in our valley, water shortages don't exist for agriculture because we have our, um, those big reservoirs upstream from us really uh, provide a lot of certainty that water will keep flowing late in the season, which it didn't always do before. So, um, so that's just another feature of our, of our landscape. And it's, a, it's an indication that, that the way these that the way these controversies turn out doesn't always directly mirror the economic and the, and the uh, population clout of, of the regions in question. It can, that equation can be influenced by you know, savvy political maneuvering and kind of um, you know, trading tips, tips back and forth. In this case, we happen to have some, um, some very senior, senior members in Congress on critical committees related to appropriations. So. Um, if these guys wanted the money to actually get their projects built, then they had to deal with, with the folks in my part of the world. So this is, as these controversies have been going on for, like I said, 100 years, and um, all the major institutions that came up, sprung up around the, this 1930s controversy related to the biggest diversions, uh, celebrated their 75th anniversaries recently, and reading histories of it, same arguments back and forth that are going on right now, exactly the same. So it's deja vu all over again, but the difference is that now we're really getting to the point where, um, you know, where our needs are in the foreseeable future going to outstrip the supplies that have been identified. So this is, again, this is the state of Colorado as a whole, and the, this line on top is the population projections. Again, we're projected to start to double by 2050 or so. And that could be low, medium, or high, depending on you know, a gazillion different factors. Um, this is our existing developed water supplies. So the water that we know where it's coming from. IPPs are basically they're identified projects and processes. So those are projects that are already planned. Um, those are, you know, Denver Water has a plan to enlarge this reservoir, or there's already a plan to buy so much water from agriculture to serve this municipality. So projects where they are actually have a plan to meet the need. So even if those are 100% successful, at current rates of water use, um, we're gonna, or even factoring in the fact that you know when people change out their toilets, they don't use as much water as they used to, and so on. 
you know, around 2020, you could get, there could be a, a pretty substantial gap. And um, the bulk of that population growth, again, is in the area where the water isn't. It's in the Denver metro area, and more particularly, north and south of that, um, especially south of that, because uh, there's an area that has relied on underground aquifers that they thought were bigger than they are. So they're mining their groundwater and they're running out. And so, uh, so there's, there's a pretty urgent need there. And again, the need that's growing the most is not where the water naturally exists. So um, our governor has called for a plan to fix that gap and he wants a draft to be done by the end of this year and it to be finalized next year. So this has brought all of these simmering controversies that have been bubbling along pretty much since Colorado was settled. They're really bringing it to a head. All these, all these controversies are heating up right now. Um, and there are really not that many places you can get new water to, uh, to meet these growing demands. One is conservation. Of course, if each of those new people uses a lot less water, then maybe you don't have such a big gap. Uh, the other, which has been the default, for um, growing cities for a long time is ag to urban transfers. And this gets back to our system of water law where water, the ability to use water is a private property right. So you get, you get there, you start watering your, your ground and you grow crops, but then you, know, you don't wanna do that anymore, or it's not profitable, or the city comes knocking on your door and wants to buy your water right, you can sell your water right to the city and dry up that ground. And that has happened a lot in Colorado. Um, and there are, there are a lot of areas, small towns and agricultural communities in eastern Colorado that have been really devastated by this. Because it only, you need to keep an agricultural economy viable, you need a critical mass of, of farmers to you know, be producing. Otherwise you can't keep your tractor dealer, you can't keep your distributor in business. So there's a real domino effect once a certain number of people switch over. And, um, and there's a pretty big consensus in the state that we don't want to keep going to that for new water because our agricultural heritage is important. It's important to be able to feed ourselves and, and the open space provided by agriculture is just um, an important part of the Colorado lifestyle. So the other place is more tunnels and ditches bringing water from the West Slope to the Front Range. And now none of these are easy. This one right here, I already mentioned that our headwaters, communities, and streams have been devastated by really huge diversions already in many cases. And there's not um, very much interest on the part of the people that live there or downstream in having more. And uh, in addition, there's, um, if you develop too much more out of our side of the divide, then we could end up getting in trouble with California and Nevada and Arizona downstream. And we have obligations to you know, make sure enough water keeps flowing to them to meet our interstate agreement. So that's, that is um, not, not easy. Um, egg to urban transfers, I already mentioned some of the problems there, which makes conservation seem like the no-brainer um, because you know, they still are growing bluegrass in Denver and there are still lawns you know, in the suburbs out there. And actually about half of a typical uh, family's water use will be outdoor water use. So it seems like you know, that would be a really easy way to just relieve all this pressure. You can keep your agriculture, you can keep your nice headwaters environment and your trout fishing and all that. But um, this, the cities on the Front Range have actually done a pretty good job with the easy stuff that you can do for conservation. They've had great public relations campaigns. We had a big drought in 2012 and uh, uh, 2002 and another one last year and the year before that really got people thinking about water and they cut their use about 20%. To really get enough to relieve the pressure on these two, we'd have to run into another one of our deeply held values, which is um, the fact that we don't like regulation very much. <laughs> And we really, you know, local control is a very strong value in our state. And um, everybody on the West Slope really wants the Front Range cities to conserve like crazy and not grow a single blade of grass. But the kind of regulations that would be required to make them do that, what if they apply to us too? We don't like that. <laughs> so, so this is a much stickier knot than it seems at first. But some combination of these three sources 
is what it's going to take to you know, get us to 2050. And then occasionally people bring up the question of, well, what about 2051? You know, it's, it's, not, like the, it's not like the world is going to stop changing at that point. So we've got kind of a naughty problem in Colorado with how we're going to meet our future needs. But our needs in Colorado pale in comparison to the needs in the Colorado Basin as a whole. This is a graph from a recent, it was issued last year from the Bureau of Reclamation, a giant supply and demand study on the whole Colorado River Basin. And the red line shows water use starting about 1919. So it's been steadily climbing, kind of tapered off a little bit there. And this is our water supply. And you can see, let's see, you can see it was pretty high right about when they negotiated that compact between the upper and lower basin states. So they thought they had a lot more water to deal with than they turned out to actually have. But it's extremely variable, but the trend, the trend is not so good. It's, it's relatively steady to declining. And this is over 10 years ago now that these lines crossed, where demands on the Colorado River system as a whole have exceeded the amount of water flowing into the system. And then projecting out, these lines are very fuzzy because they take into account the climate change projections, in which there's a lot of uncertainty there. There's a little bit less uncertainty with demand. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's uncertain, but the median of all the different projections is not looking so good. I think that um, the projections are that, you know, maybe about 9% decline in, in runoff for the whole system. And since we're already crossed, then that's, that's not so good. <laughs> um, and that's a 9% decline from the historical average. But actually, you know, the last 20 or 30 years, our hydrology has actually been worse than the climate change projections. So these climate change projections, if anything, could be on the conservative side. So this, in a nutshell, is why you see all those news stories in the New York Times about the bathtub rings in those reservoirs. Because the only way that you can keep using more water than the system is producing is if you have these giant buckets. But you can only do that for so long. You know, that gives you security to weather um, relatively short-term droughts, but both the climate change projections and um, you don't even have to get into whether climate change is happening or not, although it does seem to be happening, just going into the tree ring records, just the, the observed historical record um, is only about you know, 100, 150 years. But if you go back and look at ancient tree rings, um, you can see that our region has experienced both deeper and more severe droughts than we've seen in our very short period of habitating this area. So, uh, and we're really, you know, we're starting to hit the limits of our system's ability to handle that kind of drought. So getting a handle on demand is really, you know, because we can't really, there's a limit to what we can do on um, the supply side of things. People are always talking about desalination in California and piping water from the Missouri River and things like that. But all of those different kinds of projects that would actually put more water into the system would be extremely expensive. And when you pump, pump water uphill for hundreds of miles, that takes a lot of energy, which in turn takes water, usually. Um, so most of those kind of you know, people that study these things seriously seem to think that most of those big new supply projects are kind of pipe dreams at this point. So this is, um, this is a real conundrum. And you have these dropping reservoir <laughs> levels. And um, so some of the impacts that you have from these supply and demand imbalances is, you know, these reservoirs are dropping. So you know that you can, you're only buying yourself so much time. Um, and then also all the modifications that we've already done have have put the species that evolved in these river systems in the historical hydrology, it's put them under a lot of stress. Um, and then just everybody that has come to rely on the way we've been managing water for the last you know, 100 years or so um, becomes at risk. So some very tangible uh, examples are that Lake Mead is, the level has been dropping closer and closer to Las Vegas's intake for their water supply. And that's where they get 98% of their water. So they're drilling another tunnel, but still that's, that's a critical, you know, you can't really, the water is not useful to Las Vegas. That's 2 million people that could totally be out of water if the 
reservoir gets below a certain point. And then um, with Lake Powell upstream, um, that's what's referred to as the upper basin's kind of bank account for making sure we have enough water to deliver downstream. Those levels have been dropping a lot too, and there's concern that if we have a few more dry years, it'll get too low to generate power from, um, from the, um, now I'm blanking on the name of that dam, but, um, huh? No, not Hoover Dam, it's Glen Canyon Dam. So, if, and if the water level in Lake Powell gets too low to generate power through Glen Canyon Dam, you have other cascading effects. Um, you have, that actually provides power to a lot of the Southwest, so you have spiking um, power rates. And then also, if, um, if you can't sell that power anymore, there's a lot of money you're not taking in, and that money is funding a lot of our endangered fish recovery projects and salinity control and a whole lot of other projects that have become very important to people in the basin. And then also, if the power drops too low to deliver power, it's also too low for the upper basin to keep delivering the water that we're legally obligated to deliver downstream. And scariest of all is the fact that if the upper basin states don't figure out a way to keep those levels high enough, then the feds will step in and do something. And that's a very, very scary thing in my part of the world. <laughs> everyone, is, everyone really wants to, as much as possible, um, keep the power in the state's hands. The states traditionally administer water, and it's through these interstate compacts that they figured out how to divvy it up. And there's this huge, scary question mark of, oh my gosh, if the Department of Interior steps in and does something, what are they going to do, and who's it going to harm? So, um, so there's a lot of anxiety. And this could, there's something like a 20% chance that this could happen within the next five years if we have, um, you know, if the hydrology we've had for the last five to 10 continues. So probably not, but it's a, too big of a risk to ignore. And we have a really good snowpack this year, so that's giving them a little bit more time. But you know, sooner or later, we're gonna come back to that issue. Cause like in 2011, Lake Powell went up by about 50 feet. We had a huge snowpack. And then by this time last year, it was all gone, and the levels were lower than before. So this year, it's supposed to go up another 40 feet, but you know that maybe buys us a year, maybe two. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. So kind of dire situation overall. Business as usual, obviously can't continue. Um, but there actually are amazingly. Oh, and I forgot the biggest impact of all: that dry Colorado River Delta. It's been over 30 years since water flowed through that delta to Mexico. I mean, well, it's been flowing to Mexico, but it hasn't been making it to the sea because um, in the treaty between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, Mexico gets 1.5 million acre feet a year. And I talk about acre feet a lot. That's about the amount that, of water that it would take to fill a football field, about a foot high. So um, usually considered to be enough for about two to three households for a whole year. So Mexico is allocated one and a half million acre feet, which we've never failed to provide, but they have their own irrigation systems there. So it hasn't actually, and there's no allocation for the river. So you've had a dry Colorado Delta for a long, a long, long time. So lots of impacts from the supply and demand imbalance. But there are some signs of hope. Um, first of all, before I talk about these solutions, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Um, I talked quite a bit uh, earlier about the kind of east-west in Colorado controversies about water with Trans Mountain diversions going from the dry side, from the wet side to the dry side, um, and the impacts that are related to that. But recently, just last, just yeah, just the end of last year, an agreement was actually signed between Denver Water and pretty much all the local government and water provider entities on the western slope in the Colorado Basin that would allow Denver to get about 17, 18,000 acre feet a year more. They're gonna enlarge a reservoir on their side of the hill so they can take and store a little bit more water out of their existing system. So again, taking more water from the west slope. But um, the west slope entities got some really important concessions. Um, in agreeing to go along with that. The Denver Water actually agreed to 
you know, help out the headwaters communities with some bypass flows. I mean, for them, like tiny trickles of water in the stream can make the difference between a live fishery and a dead fishery, between an economy that, you know, works and doesn't work, <laughs> between their quality of life that's, you know, kind of okay and, you know, in the toilet. So they, they got some um, really, uh, in terms of the timing and the management of, of flows, um, and Denver's agreement to not, at certain times, not suck all the water out of some of these tributaries upstream uh, to kind of make up for some of the past damages. And then there's, uh, there's the Learning by Doing project to basically re-engineer parts of the upper Colorado River that just don't, ha you know, that have half the water that they used to. And so they don't, you know, if you have a riverbed that used to carry twice as much water, and you have half that water in it, it's, it's a problem. The temperatures are really high. The, you know, the flushing flows don't get the crud out and the fish habitat really suffers. They're working to both retime some of the flows and kind of re-engineer the river to work with what's left to make it as healthy as possible, which um, involves some, involves some re-engineering of the riverbed. And then most importantly, probably, Denver agreed to, um, to not pro prospect for any more big projects on the West Slope without the acquiescence of the West Slope entities and to not expand its service area anymore. So, um, so there was some, it took like eight years to negotiate uh, and it all came about because Denver wasn't sure that they would get the permits that they needed to enlarge their reservoir and make their system more secure because um, there have been instances in the past where they've had a big project and it's gotten blocked because there was opposition from environmentalists and from all the West Slope entities that were worried and you know they wanted to have some security that they wouldn't have opposition in that permitting process. So therefore they were able to, they were willing to um, negotiate on a lot of other things. So, and there's actually a similar agreement with the other major Trans Mountain Diverter, which is farther north, it's called Northern Water. So those are, um, some ways that you know you can keep kind of splitting the baby, and you know there there are impacts, but then if you just kind of remanage how you do it, you can actually mitigate a lot of the impacts. So, and there are some signs that that these historical adversaries are kind of sick of being in court all the time. I mean, some of these court cases over minute details of. Um, how all the water law related to this stuff works have dragged on for decades. And then when the courts decide, you don't know what you're gonna get. It could be worse for both. So they had some pretty strong incentives to come together and, and most folks, including a lot of environmental advocates that were parties to the negotiations, feel pretty good about them for the most part. Um, and then on a smaller scale also, you have some really promising ideas. I remember I just said 85% more or less of our water goes to agriculture. Well, a lot of those ditches and practices were established 100 years ago. They leak. They, um, you know, they're, they're not efficient. They take way more water out of the stream than is actually needed to grow the crop. And, but it takes money to fix all these things and upgrade them. And farming is not always the most lucrative business. But there are, have been increasingly partnerships between, and this is the location of one, um, between conservation entities and irrigation ditches to upgrade the infrastructure a lot um, so it actually works better to deliver the water to the crops and at the same time leave more water in the streams so the recreation and the fisheries benefit from that. So um, they're not everywhere but they're growing and people are figuring them out and people with really conflicting values about what the highest and best water, use of the water is have found ways to come together and um, and really get mutual benefits. So those are increasing. And oh, this is a stretch of the upper Colorado that's been impacted and, and is um, undergoing some restoration. So we have, you know, we have a number of different agreements. And actually in the Grand Junction area where I am are endangered fish that were heavily impacted by, you know, really most of the river getting taken out of the river to get dumped on our fields to grow our crops. Um, with some of this money from all that power generated from Lake Powell, the Endangered Fish Recovery Program uh, funded some major infrastructure upgrades on our big canals so that they don't have to take as much water out to get it transmitted all the way down to the last people in the line. Because what they were doing 
was sometimes taking just about all of the river, and then a lot of it would get dumped back in 15 miles downstream. But meanwhile, that critical habitat is mostly dry. But with some irrigation canal improvements, they put some check structures in so they didn't have to take so much water out to get it to the end of the line. So again, um, I'm oversimplifying, so I mean, it, it takes a lot of work to actually make these things work, but it's possible, and it, there have been some real gains. And the biggest one is that is the Colorado River this spring, after a decade of drought, heading for the Delta. There's actually, it's called Minute 319, it's an amendment to the treaty between Mexico and the U.S., and all of the states that share the Colorado River and a bunch of conservation groups were involved, and they actually worked out a deal that is getting water back to the sea in the Colorado system again, in spite of all of these supply and demand imbalances. And the way that they did it um, was through years, really, of studying the situation, studying how the rivers manage, studying the needs of the system, and figuring out a way to make the system, really optimize the system so it works better for everybody that relies on it. So Mexico can store water in Lake Mead because they didn't really have a way, you know, a big bucket to store water in to, you know, even out the differences between wet and dry years. Um, they also had a lot of infrastructure that was damaged in an earthquake a few years ago, so they got some money to upgrade that infrastructure and store water in Lake Mead so that they could, you know, use it later. And storing more of the water in Lake Mead, no matter who it belongs to, benefits Las Vegas because it means that their intake is in less danger. And somehow California got more water out of it. I don't know how. That's a very, very intricate agreement. But, um, but the upshot is that through really studying the system and where the interests of all the players um, were, uh, some very savvy negotiators in the affected states um, and on both sides of the border, Mexico and the U.S., and these conservation groups, um, they, they figured out a way to make this, make this work, and they let a big pulse flow go in the end of March, and I think that's still flowing. So that kind of simulates on a smaller scale the kind of flooding that used to happen. And then <coughs> the conservation groups have committed to lease water from Mexican irrigators to keep a base flow going after that. And this agreement only um, will last for about five years, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really important experiment. And even, you know, right now our snowpack this year is looking pretty good, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's been a long, intense drought, and there's some serious worries about supply, but because this agreement makes the system work better for everyone, even the traditional water users had enough of a stake in making it work that nobody pulled the plug on it, and it's actually happening. So those are some kids playing in the water. Nobody under 30 had ever seen water here before. Um, so I, I mean, if that can happen, just looking at the overall supply demand picture and how the politics <coughs> lined up, I never would have predicted that this was possible. So, but if this is possible, I think a lot's possible. <laughs> so um, it doesn't always happen, it's not a gimme, but with enough determination <coughs> and, um, and really, you know, doing that hard work to understand the interests of everybody else that has a stake in the resource, uh, it's, it's possible to do some pretty amazing things. So that's, that's all I have. Very nice. Uh, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief so that we have plenty of time for discussion and question and answer. Um, and uh, as I understand it, my, uh, my role here is to really provide some bridging comments so that uh, those of us here in Western North Carolina have um, the uh, ability to sort of make connections between what we, we just heard, which might seem at the surface to be quite distinct from, from what we have here. Uh, and I actually came up with many, many, many similarities. I'm not going to bore you with my long laundry list, uh, but I will just throw out a few to get you thinking about some of the things that we might want to follow up on in discussion or question and answer uh, that I think are, are really interesting points of contact. Uh, first, it's very clear that both in Colorado and in Western North Carolina, uh, water is really important in economic development. Uh, and maybe for different uh, legal reasons, and, and we have different histories and cultures, but at its core, uh, water is essential to uh, 
ensuring population growth, um, you know, residential development, agricultural development, and uh, other economic development. And some of the more recent uh, sort of big name or big he headline making um, economic developments in our part of this uh, state have to do with, uh, very much have to do with water, uh, breweries. You, know, you think about what, what has drawn uh, breweries from the western part of the country to the east. There are lots of different factors, but um, one of the things that um, they are interested in is our clean, abundant, uh, great water, right? So if you think about whether or not your area or another area that is dependent on this intricate water system, um, they wouldn't have the same kinds of opportunities that we have here. Uh, but the, the theme is similar in terms of that, that importance of, of water for economic development. Uh, and, and Hannah mentioned that in a couple of places uh, the role of uh, intangible values, which of course is sort of near and dear to my heart, uh, but it seems to me that those intangible values, um, even just looking at this last slide, so the value of experiencing water in this place for the first time, there's something important about that that often doesn't get acknowledged, and uh, I think Hannah said, um, how we relate to water is changing because of this changing recognition. And I think in this place, uh, we've been blessed with an amazing set of natural resources, including an, an amazing set of water resources. But we are um, perhaps uh, more generally uh, becoming aware of the value of those resources, especially water, not just for economic development, but for our pleasure for recreation, for ecosystem services, um, and in this part of the state, of course, um, tying into that, recreation is quite important, which is something that, that Hannah mentioned is, is growing in importance in, in her part of the world. Uh, a lot of our economic activity here, especially uh, in terms of uh, tourism economy, is water dependent. You think about uh, fishing and rafting and kayaking. It's also a very important contributor to our quality of life here. Uh, we know several uh, people, I'm sure, all of us, that um, locate here because it is such a lovely place to be. Uh, there are all sorts of people that come to, to move to this place just because of the kayaking opportunities, right? So having that water resource um, is really important for all sorts of, of reasons. I was also interested in uh, hearing that the role of politics uh, is uh, also quite important in Colorado. Um, this is probably not a surprise to anyone who's, who's followed uh, water issues, either in the eastern U.S. or the western U.S., but uh, how we uh, allocate that water is often a function of these institutions, these institutional arrangements that, that come about, and some of that is, is uh, of course, driven by um, politics, and, and that can change over time. So. Uh, the allocation that exists currently may in fact change as the winds of change uh, occur uh, politically. And then uh, finally, uh, so we can get started here on the Q&A, um, I was uh, not surprised but um, happy to be reminded that uh, culturally we have also some uh, similarities with many people that live in Colorado and that is that uh, we really value local control and we don't tend to like regulation, especially federal regulation. So if we can solve our own problems in our own backyard, we tend to think that that is preferable and that seems to be um, an Im important uh, piece of the story, uh, both in Colorado and here in Western North Carolina. So I will stop there, uh, just give you a little food for thought, a little taste uh, of some of the similarities and then open it up for questions uh, and discussion. Yes. Um, with eight inches of rain a year, that's uh, approximately just a little more than 200,000 gallons per acre. And, you know, um, I know Tucson has a program of incentives to uh, encourage people <coughs> to put in rainwater harvesting systems and tanks and, um, and earthworks, and, um, and that seems to work. It seems to me that that could, the money for that could be uh, taken from capital projects that, you know, would incentivize people to do these very simple systems and that, that we would manage the rainwater, you know, as opposed to only managing surface water and groundwater resources. So I would like to know if there's any approach along those lines in Colorado. 
actually, for the most part in Colorado, hard to drink rainwater is illegal. <laughs> because it has to be with our fire appropriation system. Um, with the thought being that, that that water that's running off of your roof um, is destined to end up in some stream. And it's, and somebody is you know, downstream, I might have a claim on it. I'm referring more to earthworks that put it down into the ground so that it travels to the to the streams and creeks more slowly and, mm -hmm. and still goes through the entire water system. I, I knew that you know that <coughs> putting rain from uh, from roofs into tanks is illegal, but I there's uh, you know harvesting rain into um, uh, there hasn't been a lot of activity on that. There is some, it, yeah, you're, like I can, it's legal for me to channel the water from my downspout into my you know, garden bed so that it, you know, I just can't hold on to it. Um, but there's not, you know, it's kind of, in Colorado, we actually haven't gone very far with that because as I pointed out in that slide, we're really, our supply and demand crunch, with a few exceptions, is kind of in the future. I mean, right now, especially in the Grand Valley where I live, we have plenty of water. We're just afraid of losing it um, to these demands upstream and downstream. So looking ahead, we can see you know, the challenges, but, um, but it hasn't, push hasn't come to shove to that extent where we are yet. I think, I think we'll see more of that going forward. You know, for example, you know, uh, um, Denver could pay residents of the upper Colorado fifty dollars a month to put in earth, earthworks and you know increase the value <coughs> of the river. Yeah, well, a lot of our um, you know so-called inefficient irrigation practices in the high mountain valleys actually function that way in a lot of ways because if you flood irrigate these high mountain meadows, then that. Um, you know, it actually supports late season flows in the streams. It does recharge those aquifers. So, um, so there, there, there definitely is. And people are starting to think a little bit more about about using using the aquifers that way as part of our supply. Because um, of course, it's a lot lower impact to recharge aquifers than it is to build a dam and put a reservoir in. It's complicated by our geology, though. Like you wouldn't want to do that down where I live in the Grand Valley because our soils are really salty. So when the water depercolates through them, the quality that goes back in the river is terrible. I mean, we have a ton of um, a ton of programs um, to <coughs> line canals and prevent that depercolation because you know if it gets too salty, then it's useless for agriculture downstream. And then there's selenium that gets into it too, and that deforms the fish and <coughs> causes problems for waterfowl and everything else. So it's very site specific. What makes sense? Yes, back here. Uh, is your uh, electric power <coughs> generation? Um, some of it is. <coughs> some of it. So, I mean, there's like Lake Powell and Lake Mead are both major generators of electricity for the region. Um, and that power plant that I mentioned in Lake <coughs> Canyon it um, produces some. We also have our coal-fired power plants and increasingly natural gas-fired power plants as well. One really exciting development to me, though, is that you know we've had this irrigation infrastructure for a long time, and increasingly, uh, folks are putting hydro plants on that. So that, to me, is true green energy because it's not really creating any new impacts. You've already modified the flow of the stream, and you're just you're just uh, harvesting power off of it um, that is going unharvested right now. So there've been some moves to ease the permitting. For that, and we also are having, you know, more and more solar, more and more wind. I don't know the exact proportions, but we we rely on all of it. Thanks. Yes. I just had a kind of a, a more general question, um, or kind of a vague question, but it, it just struck me while you were talking about all the different cultural groups, like all the different constituencies. We have all. I can recognize all of the above here too. The the agricultural, the recreational uses, the urban dwellers. How in the the agreement that did sound like that had brought a lot of interest together. Can, can you can you draw any sort of broad um, sort of uh, conclusions about what what got them to the table? You know, how did you get them to talk to each other? Uh, well, they really well, not you personally. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I wish every person had such powers. That would be fantastic. <laughs> um, well, it's basically, I 
and people have to come to the realization that they have more to gain from working together than from 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 not working together. And the way that the water interests line up in Colorado, it's, it's really interesting because um, a lot of the west uh, the, a lot of the West Slope agriculture folks who are really quite conservative and really kind of look askance at these environmental water rights and things like that, they have a lot of common cause with the environmental groups. They just want to keep water flowing in the streams and not want to see more of it go over the hill. So you get some really kind of um, you know, non-traditional non -traditional alliances that way because they share a common interest in keeping water on our side of the divide. So you'll see our you know, very conservative county commission, uh, county commissioners sometimes endorsing you know, a set of principles put out by Trout Unlimited because it says that there shouldn't be any more trans mountain diversions. <laughs> so um, there are a few different factors that can bring people together. A common enemy always really helps. <laughs> and, um, and it's kind of helpful that a lot of those recreationists and environmentalists that want to really have a strong interest in keeping water flowing on the western slope live in Denver, you know, and they, they live in these urban areas. So the more folks there that probably live in Denver because they like to recreate in the mountains, the more that they're, you know, aware of what the trade-offs are, they can become really powerful allies to the, you know, conservative folks on the west slope that have different interests, but they have a common, um, you know, uh, they have different values, but a common interest. So that's one. And then, um, and then this this threat of federal action or court action is another powerful incentive for people to come together. Like um, with the endangered fish recovery program, that is, you know, as long as as long as all the parties can work together <coughs> to get the species on track for recovery through voluntary measures, then they don't have to face the then they don't have to face the prospect of involuntary measures, like cutting people off, you know. So that if there's a threat of some kind of uh, of some kind of restriction that somebody else might set that you don't know what it is, it provides a really strong incentive for people to come to the table and figure out a way to sort out their own problems. So. Yeah. Are there other questions? When you showed a graph for the population and the demand, and I noticed on the graph about 1988 or 89 there was a significant spike and then fast fall off there. Is that a climate? What what was the cause of the spike? Or do you? Know, the, um, in in the the size of the. Uh, well, our if you look at historically at Colorado River flows, they're extremely variable. I mean, they're it's you know, the graphs just go up and down. So as far as the... About 1989? Yeah, 1983, there was a record flood, actually. There was a um, just a gigantic series of storms that came through. And there's actually, we just hosted a great speaker at CMU, uh, Kevin Pedarco. He wrote a book called The Emerald Mile that I highly recommend. But it talks about, um, it talks about that 1983 flood. And the Bureau and the forecasters kind of underestimated how much water would be coming into Lake Powell. And um, so they weren't really prepared. They didn't let enough water out ahead of time. So they were trying to keep the dam together <laughs> as all this water was coming down. And meanwhile, they're releasing way more water into the Grand Canyon than had been there for decades. And it's causing havoc with all the raptors there. So this book braids together the stories of the raptors that were stuck in the canyon, the engineers trying to hold the dam together. And then these crazy guys that decided, wow, we can do a speed run through the Grand Canyon in these mm -hmm. conditions. <laughs> so they made it through in 36 hours. But yeah, that was, I mean, that was a wet period. And it's been really since, um, you know, since the turn of the decade that we've, we've had much drier conditions. And it's, um, I mean, it is the climate change that's consistent with climate change models, but it's also consistent with just the historical variability of, um, of flows in the color. I mean, the, you know, Mesa Verde was abandoned in a, you know, in a period of drought. So uh, the likelihood of droughts like that is probably increased with climate change. But even without climate change, we could be in trouble. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I just was also struck when you were talking about how uh, in Colorado that, I mean, water that is like property rights, you know, that they do, you can, and, I mean, uh, how does that compare, generally speaking, with other parts? Is that unusual? Is that more typical? Or is that unusual? It's, it's Western. Okay. I mean, it's uh, exactly the, the exact way that it's administered. 
varies a lot between states, but prior appropriation, like you know, west of 100th meridian, is, is pretty much the way it goes. It's 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 you know, once the resource gets scarce enough, but um, yeah, because when you get people buying and selling, they're the water on their own. Oh, you have to go to court and prove no injury to other water rights holders, so it can be very contentious. And in Colorado, you have to go to court and sell it administratively in other states. But yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, all the population in particular, it's like about Southern California, which draws on this as a lower population. Uh -huh. population at some point gets so large that you have to have that legal structure. You have to just get rid of the prior appropriation legal structure and go to some other way of appropriating the water. Well, the, um, <coughs> I don't, I don't know exactly, but it's not like I don't have a water right. I mean, my city has a water right. Well, it depends. Some farmers um, or ranchers, especially, you know, they're up in the headwaters. They might have their own, their own individual water right, but often they're um, it's a ditch company. So some kind of collective of different folks that share a ditch um, will have will own a water right. And then, um, you know, if the water came from some Bureau of Reclamation project, then the rules can be a little different. So we have some canals that were developed privately in our valley, and those, but they could sell the water off of their land. But the ones under the federal project, that water is tied to the land, it would take an act of Congress for them to actually sell their water right. So um, so it gets very intricate very quickly. <laughs> so so it, it sounds like that system actually works pretty well, or has worked pretty well. Um, it, you know, um, our water managers, our water establishment is very invested in it. We've had a few initiatives. Colorado has a, it's, it's very easy to change our constitution and our laws through the initiative system, through ballot measures. And uh, there keep on being ballot measures introduced to introduce what's called the public trust doctrine, which would, um, I guess, make it easier to determine a, a public value in water in the streams that could override some of these some of these um, water rights that dry up the stream sometimes. And that really freaks out our water establishment. Um, and I, I think a lot of the measures have been pretty poorly written where I can't figure out who it would be that would make these decisions about what's in the public interest. So that, that introduces a lot of chaos. But it's indicative of the fact that there is a strong, <coughs> especially among people that are more environmentally minded, that our system doesn't <coughs> give enough um, weight to the needs of the environment and the recreational economy. So um, then there's a feeling among other folks that, are, that see the writing on the wall in the traditional water manager community to think, well, maybe we should figure out a way to make our system more flexible to accommodate these other interests so that we can not throw the baby out with the bathwater in you know, responding to the people that are mad about this. So it's, it, it works really well for some people. It doesn't always work well for the environment. It's, it has the advantage of providing a certain amount of stability, I guess. In Colorado, in Colorado, the rights in general are much more quantified. There are other states that have prior appropriation where nobody knows what their water rights quantity really is. And there, you know, it's, it's um, New Mexico has had some real challenges because they've been in deep drought for a long time. And they're actually getting to the point where they have to administer their water rights system and cut off junior users. They didn't really used to do that. But if you don't really administer the system, then it stops working. And, you know, you have, you have people who are really injured. And we've had issues in Colorado where for a long time groundwater that's tributary to the streams wasn't recognized as tributary to the streams. So people got used to irrigating their lands with this. Well, meanwhile, they are drawing down the rivers. And so the people that had relied on the flows in the rivers are getting injured. And so the courts ended up coming in and shutting off people's wells that they'd spent thousands of dollars to establish. And so, you know, if you don't administer these things consistently over time, then, you know, you can have some real problems. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Leah. Give them a hand, please.